Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here at uh, USENIC Security to present our latest work in authenticated calling titled Authentic Call, Efficient Identity and Content Authentication for Phone Calls. Uh, I'm Brad Reeves. I'm an assistant professor at North Carolina State, and this is work with joint, uh, joint work with colleagues at the University of Florida, Logan Blue, Hadi Abdullah, Luis Vargas, Patrick Trainer, and Tom Shrimpton. And I want to talk about the phone network today because it's still one of our most critical infrastructures. Biggins rely on it every day for everything from quick calls to friends to coordinate dinner to calls between grid operators to coordinate responses to power outages. But the phone network doesn't have all of the guarantees that we need for a secure, trusted network. And a recent story illustrates this well. I'm talking, of course, about uh, the DNC hacks that happened during the U.S. elections last year. The, uh, do, do, while the attacks were taking place, the FBI called the D Democratic National Committee headquarters uh, many times over the course of several weeks to warn them about these attacks, but they didn't take the call seriously. There we go. But they didn't take the call. Uh, is this any better? Okay. Uh, anyway, they did. Despite all the calls from the FBI, the IT staff didn't take it seriously. And when they were asked, why didn't you take the call seriously? They said, we couldn't tell if this was a real call or a prank call. And this is a problem for a network that we all trust. Uh, but it's not the only problem that we have with the phone network. Uh, of course, uh, many of you have probably received one of the billions of robocalls that are placed every month. Now, these are distracting and they're annoying. Uh, but and some of these calls can have severe consequences. Like the, uh, <clears throat> there we go. Uh, like the uh, IRS scams that hit the every, U.S. every year around tax time. These scams steal millions of dollars from their victims. But these aren't the worst kind of call you can receive. Uh, in a swatting attack, uh, attackers spoof a call to 911, claiming to be a victim uh, facing an active shooter. Uh, this prompts a rapid armed police response, and it wastes public resources, but more importantly, puts lives at risk. Now, all of these problems have a single root cause, and that is that users simply cannot authenticate the calls that they place or receive. Now, the problem goes deeper than that, because in general, neither carriers nor end users can provide guarantees about who is on a call or where that call is coming from. And a consequence of this is that faking your caller ID is trivial. There are apps that do this in the market right now. And so what's at the root of this problem? Why is it that uh, not even my carrier can tell me if it's the real FBI calling or not? Well, the answer has to do with how we've built the modern phone network. Now, uh, once upon a time, uh, phone networks were uh, technologically simple and homogenous, and uh, I had um, only a few operators, typically national telecommunications companies. But as technology has improved and uh, with the events like deregulation, what the phone network has now become a network of networks much like the internet. And this has had uh, drastic uh, consequences for the security of, of these networks. And so to understand more about what's happening, let's take a look at a hypothetical call path from the FBI to the DNC. Now, as you can see here, uh, the, the call begins at the FBI headquarters, is delivered uh, into the VoIP carrier servicing the FBI. Now, because that carrier doesn't have a direct peering relationship with the landline carrier serving the DNC, uh, the call actually has to transit one or more intermediate phone networks. So to understand the security implications of this, let's look at what happens to the call along the way. Now, the first thing that happens, and this is the where the root of the problem starts, is that identity is asserted and not attested. And so uh, what, what happens when the FBI places the call is that the VoIP carrier can authenticate the FBI, and they know that this is a call originating with the FBI. But as soon as that call is delivered into the intermediate phone network, uh, the receiving network has no choice but to take the, car the VoIP carrier at its word that, yes, this is a call from the FBI. The receiving carrier has no way to independently verify the identity of the caller. Uh, and one of the reasons for this uh, is that um, signaling protocols often change at network gateways. And so as a result, even if the VoIP carrier wanted to add some additional information to uh, clarify that, yes, this is a call from the FBI to uh, um, provide strong authentication of the call, uh, technologically that's going to be really hard to do. Uh, 
Uh, and in particular, the consequence of this is that there's no guaranteed shared data path between endpoints. And so, um, as <clears throat> And so, modify, so adding uh, and modifying the phone network to add in authentication information is going to be very difficult. Uh, now, the third thing that happens to the call as it flows through the network is that the audio actually changes. So uh, bet between network effects like loss as well as things like noise and uh, changes in compression used uh, throughout the network, the call audio that is sent by the uh, FBI is going to be different than, on a bitwise level than what the DNC actually receives. But ultimately, it's the heterogeneity of the network that complicates authentication because each network authenticates its end users differently and has no good mechanism of exchanging strong authentication mechanisms within itself. So understanding the problem now, uh, we need a solution. And uh, the insight of this work is that rather than trying to change the core network, we can use an auxiliary data channel to actually exchange authenticating information. And in particular, this work relies on the insight that most phones nowadays have access to an internet, some sort of internet connect net connection. Now, this connection um, may not have the same uh, bandwidth or quality of the phone network, but it's enough that we can use to authenticate a phone call. And so, and this is true for all modalities of phone, whether we're talking cellular, VoIP, or landline. And so the question that this work seeks to answer is, how can this data channel be used to authenticate phone calls? And to answer this question, we built the Authentical system. Authentical cryptographically authenticates uh, call parties and call content end-to-end -end for regular phone calls through an auxiliary data channel. And Authentical does this before the call. And so when a phone is ringing, a user will have an indication of whether or not the call has been authenticated. Uh, and this means that uh, when they pick up their phone to make a security decision about whether they want to answer the call, uh, they can now do the same thing but with Authentical with strong cryptographic guarantees. Authentical is fast, adding only one to one and a half seconds to call setup. Authentical offers mutual authentication of the call in both directions. Uh, it also protects the call content to verify it as authentic. And finally, Authentical is designed to prevent abuse by robocalling users. Now, to build this system, uh, we need two core mechanisms. The first mechanism that we're going to discuss in this talk today are the protocols that, we, that Authentical uses to enroll phones and to authenticate incoming calls using a data channel. The second mechanisms that we're going to discuss are the techniques that we use uh, to authenticate the actual call audio, to protect the call content and ensure call integrity. And I want to note here that existing content authentication techniques, things like HMACs and signatures, are not going to solve this problem. We're going to need a different set of tools. And so uh, let's begin by uh, taking a look at the protocols and realizing the problem space. In particular, we need to provide authentication, but uh, in a setting where neither par party is likely to have a public-facing IP address, um, either because they're behind a NAT or uh, because they're on a cellular connection, and it turns out that cellular carriers don't like you to act as a server. Uh, we also have to uh, build these protocols in a setting in which adversaries have a strong incentive to flood the system with connection requests. So if, uh, if, I were, if Authentical were a system that allowed a robocaller to determine with just a few IP packets whether a phone, was, uh, a phone number was active, live, whether there was a, a user present, and whether they were likely to answer a call, they would potentially pay millions of dollars for access to that system. And so that's a threat that we need to guard against in, with the architecture of the system. Adversaries may also uh, aim to lie about owning a particular phone to intercept those requests or to spend fraudulent calls. Now, a trusted intermediary can solve some of these issues, but uh, we have to guard against the risk of a compromise of that trusted intermediary itself. And so for all of these reasons, we're going to need custom protocols uh, to uh, address all of these requirements. And so with that in mind, let's uh, <clears throat> look at how a, uh, a phone joins the Authentical system. Authentical is, issues certificates uh, to use um, for authenticating users and for authenticating individual phone calls. Uh, and so we need to have a certificate issuing protocol to ensure the client actually owns a given phone number. And so let's take a look at what that protocol looks like. We're going to have two parties, a client and a certificate authority server. 
And uh, the protocol is going to begin with a certificate issuing request um, with uh, uh, containing identities uh, and uh, public key. The uh, certificate authority is going to respond with the first part of a challenge. Uh, and so this message includes the, all of the identities from the previous message, uh, a random uh, nonce, a timestamp, and the phone number of the certificate authority. And this is important because the next message comes from the certificate authority. And it's sent not over the data network, but through a voice call. So uh, the certificate authority actually calls the client and uh, sends a second nonce uh, to be used as part of the response in the challenge response protocol. Now, in our, uh, this could be done several ways. In our implementation, we actually send uh, the long random number using uh, touch tones. Uh, once the client has received both of these numbers, the client can produce the uh, response by signing the nonces, the timestamps, and the identities, and the certificate authority, authority can then issue a certificate. Now, uh, this protocol has a number of advantages. For one, it, it has positive um, uh, guarantee that the client can actually receive a, a, a call at the phone number that they're claiming to own. It also has an interesting property that uh, we can implement this entirely in software without having a human in the loop. And what that means is that uh, we can, uh, with very, fairly low friction, uh, set certificate expiration dates to, uh, to be very short time periods, say one week, two weeks, or a month. Uh, the idea being that we want to guard against uh, an adversary getting hold of a certificate for much longer than they own a, uh, a phone number. Uh, and so by implementing in the software, we can uh, seamlessly update and uh, reissue certificates without having to involve a user. Now, there are some uh, limitations to this model, uh, but they, in general, they're similar to what we have with uh, internet CAs, especially in the HTTPS ecosystem. So, for example, if someone steals your phone, they can probably uh, get themselves issued a certificate on your behalf. But this is something that we've dealt with with the internet, um, and we do have the potential to do things like extended validation certificates, but uh, discussing the policies there is a little bit beyond the scope of this paper. So now that we have certificates issued, what happens when we want to make a phone call? Well, uh, we, we now have a protocol for this as well. And you'll notice that we now have three parties, the caller, the callee, and the central server S. Now, uh, the protocol is going to proceed in two phases. In the first phase, we're simply setting up the fact that there's going to be a phone call that takes place. So the caller informs the server that they wish to call the callee. And at that point, the server sends two uh, messages. One is uh, to the callee to inform them that um, R is calling and wishes to set up an authenticated phone call. The server also sends another message back to the caller. And this message simply says whether or not the callee is, in fact, an authentic call user. Now, this is to prevent an attack where the, um, where the callee actually answers a voice call and claims that they are not an authentic call user. So it pre prevents that social engineering attack from being effective. Now, what's important about this message is also what's not present in the message itself. Note that there's nothing about whether the callee is, uh, is available, whether they're live, or whether they intend to answer the phone. And so if the callee decides that they don't want a call from the caller, uh, then at this point the protocol simply times out, just like a regular phone call that's not answered. But if the callee does decide that they wish to uh, take the call, uh, then both parties uh, are going to exchange all of the information needed to establish a key end-to-end -end securely in the presence of an adversary uh, using, using um, authenticated Diffie-Hellman shares. So this uh, sets up a secret key with perfect forward secrecy. Uh, so this information is exchanged and then confirmed with uh, HMAX over the previous messages uh, using the newly established keys. And it's at this point that the voice call can proceed normally. So let's take a look at the performance of this system. And uh, by performance, what we're talking about now is how long it takes to actually authenticate a phone call. What's the experience going to be for the user? And it's important to note that regular calls already take many seconds to set up with high variance. It may seem like the call is connected almost instantaneously, but typical networks, it takes at least five to seven seconds for all the signaling to complete. And that's not taking into account any delay that the user actually takes in making a decision about whether to answer the call or not. 
And so Authentical adds a one to one and a half seconds for call establishment, depending on the networks that are being used. And we argue that this is fundamentally negligible because this is happening while the phone is ringing. And it takes about the same amount of time as it does for you to find your phone and pull it out of a, a bag or pocket uh, while it's ringing. So effectively, the user is not going to see any real difference in their calling experience. Now, the handshake that we just discussed, it deals with a caller ID spoofing attack. So uh, now we can know whether or not it's the real FBI that's calling. But there are other attacks that we need to be concerned about. So for example, once we answer the phone, how do we know that the content of the call hasn't been modified? We also need to know that uh, what we're hearing from the FBI is what they actually mean to be saying. Uh, and we also have to deal with another attack that's possible based on the architecture of Authentical. So with Authentical, we're using an out-of-band authentication to authenticate a phone call. Uh, and so when you do that, uh, you create the potential for a race condition where two parties uh, agree to have an authenticated phone call, but then uh, a well-timed adversary could come along and place a concurrent call through the phone network. And so when your phone rings, uh, your client isn't going to be able to distinguish the call from the adversary from the legitimate party because the, you can't trust the authentication information that's coming directly from the phone network. And so as a result, we need a mechanism to deal with this. And so um, <clears throat> we need, to, in particular, what we need to do is bind the voice and data channel together. Uh, and this allows us to ensure liveness as well as content integrity. And so the question then is, how in the world do we use a low bandwidth side channel to authenticate call audio? How are we going to authenticate stuff that's happening in one network in a completely different network? And so the solution for this uh, is a technique uh, from signal processing known as robust digest. And so we're going to send digests uh, of the call audio over the data channel. So this is very short um, pieces of data that we can uh, use to authenticate the call audio that we receive over the voice network. Now, digesting is really hard because call audio is legitimately modified in transit. And so what this means is that uh, the standard techniques, things that like cryptographic hashes, are not going to work here. Uh, and that's because the audio is modified as it flows through the network. And so if you take a perfectly legitimate call and try to take a, a digest, uh, a, a cryptographic hash, uh, before and after it transits the phone network, you're going to com get completely different hashes. And so what we need is a robust digest that protects the semantics of the call audio, the words that are being said, while ignoring uh, legitimate modifications, which typically have to do with um, things like noise. Now, I want to note now that cryptographically authenticating data that can change in ways that you cannot know or predict a priori is fundamentally hard. And as a result, um, the, the authentication that we do here is not going to be secured down to the bit level in the ways that uh, we're typically used to with cryptography. Nevertheless, we can build a system that can provide strong guarantees of content authenticity. And the way we do that is by uh, using an algorithm called RSH. Um, RSH um, was previously described in the signal processing literature, and at a high level what it does is compress one second of audio down into uh, just 512 bits. Uh, RSH has the interesting property that audio differences can actually be measured with bit error. So uh, small changes in audio result in small changes to the digest. Now, uh, if you're a signal processing person, you may be curious about how this system or how this algorithm works. And so I'll, I'll walk you through very briefly. Uh, what happens is you take one second of audio, window it into 30 millisecond windows, compute the LPC coefficients of each window individually, and stack them in this matrix L. Then the digest uh, uses a keyed pseudo random function to randomly select blocks from this matrix, uh, compress them with a DCT, take the top eight coefficients, and compare them. One, if the coefficient from the right is higher than the left, zero otherwise. That gives you eight digest bits, and you rinse and repeat 64 times to get a 512-bit digest. Now, RSH wasn't intended for authenticated calling, and it was only briefly analyzed in the literature. And so we had to do some additional work to make sure that this was a safe technique to use in Authentical. 
and so in particular, we needed to show a few things. one, that the randomized construction indeed protects all of the audio we needed to show that the algorithm is going to work in real systems, that it, you can actually do this on real phones in real time and that the algorithm will work in an adversarial setting where an adversary is trying to modify call audio, not just trying to um, modify the digest itself. And so uh, it's this last point that we're going to focus on in this talk. Uh, how well does this algorithm work in an adversarial setting? So to understand this, uh, we conducted two experiments. The first, we took a corpus of audio and subjected it to all of the things that happen to phone calls normally. So these are things like delay and noise, compression, transcoding, loss. And what we found was that on average, before and after network transmission, we see about 10 to 20 percent of the bits of the digest change. Now, the second experiment we did was we took different sections, uh, different seconds of audio and compared the digests between them. Uh, to see what happens if you try to replace a second of audio in a call. What, what does the digest see? Well, on average, you see about 50% bit error. And so what this means is that these groups are largely separable. Uh, and more importantly, it shows that legitimate changes to audio result in small changes to the digest, while substituting content of the call actually results in large changes. And this is, this is we can use to detect adversarial modifications to a call. Now, you'll notice that um, in a few cases, there's some overlap between the expected window of an adversarial digest, uh, the amount of error that we see there, and uh, a legitimate changes. And so that means that we are going to have a, a small false positive rate, and we need to choose a threshold. And so uh, we computed rock curves. We detailed this extensively in the paper. But the short of it is that um, your performance is going to vary based on the network conditions. Uh, and But looking at the optimal point on the rock curve, we find that if we only are interested in analyzing individual seconds of audio, if we want to authenticate every single second of audio, uh, we can detect 90% of attacks um, with a, a half of a percent false positive rate. Um, and this is roughly one false positive every three minutes. Keep in mind now that this is uh, authenticating uh, audio that is going to be changing in ways that we cannot predict or control. So this is already really good. But uh, in many cases, we don't, we don't have to be concerned about every single second of audio. Uh, human conversations are, are naturally designed to be somewhat robust to losing uh, individual words, which is about how much a second of audio is. And so as a result, in most cases, adversaries are going to have to change a lot more than just a single second of audio. And so if we wanted to reduce a false positive rate, we can take a look at five second windows and see um, and just look for instances where there's a high rate of indications of uh, adversarially modified audio. So if we look at, say, every three out of five seconds, we can detect 99 percent of content modification attacks with a single false positive rate for a typical user once every six years. Uh, so and, and so what the, we've shown with this is that uh, we now have a mechanism that can ensure that users are indeed on the correct call. We've dealt with the race condition. And we can also show that the call audio uh, has been unmodified in terms of content. And so taken together, um, what we've shown is that authentic call provides us with a new system to authenticate calls before they're answered. Mitigating fraud and providing a mechanism for you not to have to answer robocalls while increasing trust in the phone system. Uh, and we also have mechanisms to protect call content uh, from modification, all at a negligible cost to call experience. And so uh, taken together, all of this means that we can now build systems like the prototype I show on the screen, where when your phone rings, you can know with cryptographic uh, guarantees whether or not you're receiving a call from uh, the party that is claiming to call or an imposter. You can now know whether it's the FBI that's calling. And so with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'd love to take any questions you have. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Ian Goldberg, University of Waterloo. Uh, thanks for your talk. I, I didn't get one thing about the CA protocol where you get your certificate in the first place. Um, how does the CA know, like if I ask for a certificate saying, yep, I'm the FBI, 
Uh, what stage does that fail? I didn't uh, see that. So, so if Ian Goldberg tries to become the FBI, um, right. what mechanisms do we have to prevent that? Right. So that's a great question. Um, and so uh, we're, we're, going, we're assuming that the CA is going to be using standard CA best practices, um, which are not perfect, but uh, have worked reasonably well uh, for the internet at large. So um, when you're issued a certificate, um, you would uh, presumably have to provide some documentation that you are a legal authorized representative of the certificate. Uh, of I thought the you FBI. said the protocol was entirely automated, though. Yeah, so um, the, the technical portion of um, whether this phone number and this client uh, is um, is issued a certificate is entirely automated, um, and so and the reason I emphasize automation here is really more for the certificate renewal case, not for the very first um, issuance, if that makes sense. Got it. Thanks. And I just also in that CA protocol, the CA gives its own phone number in in one of the flows to the client. Yes. Why? Like, how is that used? So um, it's uh, it's an added check so that when the phone rings, so when you receive, you are re requesting a certificate when your phone rings, you know that this is actually the certificate authority. There's some additional mechanisms that you can use that for, for example, um, randomizing the phone number that the certificate authority calls from to prevent um, some, um, you know, maybe a denial of service attack where somebody tries to spoof being the CA. Um, but, but the whole point that, is that the underlying, like, you can't trust any. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, well, we can talk about it more after. Yes. Yeah. So the question the question is, uh, does our overhead numbers uh, how how does that play in with the fact that a user has to decide whether to answer the phone? Um, and so there's a there's a detail that we discuss extensively in the paper, but I gloss over for simplicity in the presentation. And that is that the signaling through the phone network is happening concurrently. Um, to the signaling to set up the phone call. It's happening concurrently with the authentication protocol. And so what's, um, uh, what that means is that um, the authentication that's happening in the background um, is actually happening concurrently. So the answer is um, the user's time to actually accept the call doesn't really affect the protocol in any way. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the question, the question is, uh, what about um, other authenticating calling systems like, um, like uh, Signal or Telegram or some of these others? Um, the principal difference between that system, those systems, and what we are doing here is those systems use peer-to-peer uh, -peer VoIP. Um, so everything over the data connection. And what we're doing here is actually showing how you can uh, use the internet to actually authenticate calls through the traditional global phone system. 